Hello everybody, Dr. Yu here with the next video from the Calgary Guide video series, Nephrotic Syndrome, Pathogenesis and Clinical Findings. Before we begin, please help us reach more viewers by liking this video just as it's starting out and by subscribing to my channel. Just hit the subscribe button below the video. Thanks. Nephrotic syndrome is a condition involving damage to the epithelial side of the glomerular capillary wall, resulting in thicker glomerular basement membrane and loss of podocyte foot processes both of which reduce the size and charge barrier to prevent protein filtration out of the bloodstream, which leads to massive loss of proteins in the urine. There are many causes of nephrotic syndrome. First, membranous glomerulonephritis, where antibodies attack the podocytes, which are specialized epithelial cells that cover the outer surfaces of glomerular capillaries. When the podocytes are damaged, that thickens the glomerular basement membrane, which destroys the charge barrier to prevent protein filtration. Second, minimal change disease, which also damages the podocytes on the epithelial side of the glomerulus in a process called podocyte effacement, flattening up the foot processes of the podocytes. This also destroys the charge barrier to protein filtration. Third, diabetes mellitus. Chronic hyperglycemia can damage glomeruli through complicated mechanisms beyond the scope of the slide, but you can check out the video on diabetic nephropathy for more. Fourth, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, FSGS, which directly injures the glomerular epithelium and endothelium. Fifth, a cluster of kidney disorders, including membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, MPGN, lupus glomerulonephritis, post-infectious glomerulonephritis, and IgA nephropathy. Since they're all autoimmune diseases, they all deposit immune complexes into the glomerulus, which also directly injures the glomerular endothelium and epithelium. Finally, amyloidosis, which is a disease involving deposition of immunoglobulin light chains. When those light chains deposit into the glomerulus, that damages the glomerulus. Simultaneously, amyloidosis also results in more immunoglobulin light chains being filtered out into the urine than can be reabsorbed back into the blood. This overflow of immunoglobulin light chains into the urine results in proteinuria of greater than 3.5 grams per day. Remember that immunoglobulin light chains is just a type of protein. Going back to the main mechanism, glomerular damage makes it more abnormally permeable to proteins within the blood. Plasma proteins are thus excessively filtered out from the blood into the urine. This results in two basic pathophysiological processes. First, excessive loss of albumin, which is the main plasma protein, into the urine. Excessive meaning in the nephrotic syndrome range of greater than 3.5 grams per day of proteinuria. Loss of albumin through the urine means a reduced level of albumin in the bloodstream, a condition known as hypoalbuminemia. Since 50% of serum calcium is albumin bound, the total serum calcium will be reduced. Remember that serum total calcium levels do not reflect ionized calcium levels or free calcium levels. And it's actually the free calcium level that's the biologically active calcium level that we care about. So because we can't measure the free ionized calcium level, we can only measure the total calcium level in the blood. Less calcium bound to albumin would make a high free calcium level appear artificially normal. So we should add 0.02 millimole to the total calcium level that we measure for every 10 gram per liter drop in albumin below 40 grams per liter. Hypoalbuminemia also affects the anion gap. The anion gap, remember, is mostly due to the negative charge of plasma albumin. Less plasma albumin will result in a reduced anion gap. So, for each 10 gram per liter drop in the albumin level below 40, we need to add 2.5 to the calculated anion gap to get the correct anion gap value. Loss of albumin through the urine also reduces the oncotic pressure of the blood. This results in the blood having a reduced ability to retain fluids within the blood vessels. Fluid will then leak into the extravascular space, resulting in underfill edema. If this edema is generalized, it's called anasarca. Sometimes this edema can only be located to the periorbital areas, which is a classic sign of nephrotic syndrome. The reduced oncotic pressure of the blood also signals the liver to increase albumin synthesis, only to have it filtered out by the kidneys. However, this increased anabolic activity of the liver will increase lipoprotein synthesis as well, resulting in hyperlipidemia, which consists of increased serum LDL, VLDL, and triglycerides. More lipids are thus filtered into the renal tubules and end up in the urine, resulting in lipiduria, presenting as lipid or fatty casts, and a Maltese cross sign under polarized light. 
The second main pathophysiological process that is triggered by nephrotic syndrome is the loss of anticoagulant proteins such as antithrombin, plasminogen, and protein C and S into the urine. Since the counterbalancing anticoagulant proteins are lost, clotting factors such as clotting factor 1, 7, 8, and 10 now have much more activity in the bloodstream. The blood becomes hypercoagulable, resulting in an increased prevalence of thromboembolic disease. Note that nephrotic syndrome does not refer to damage of the endothelium, although some processes like focal segmental glomerular nephritis and immune complex glomerular nephritis can actually affect both the endothelium and the glomerular epithelium. Since nephrotic syndrome does not involve damage to the endothelium of the glomerulus, there is no inflammatory process that is triggered, and the damaged epithelial pores are still too small for red blood cells to pass through. Therefore, there is no hematuria and no active urine sediments associated with nephrotic syndrome. So there you have it. That's all for nephrotic syndrome, pathogenesis, and clinical findings. For more topics about nephrology, you can check out the videos on pitting versus non-pitting edema, as well as the Calgary Guide video on diabetic nephropathy. Again, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.